terms of how, how did you get into this field and what's the kind of basis of, of your scientific work? So in my first semester as a doctoral student at Cornell University, I took a course, uh, Advanced Social Psychology, by a social psychologist uh, named Dennis Regan. And about halfway through the semester, he assigned a book, which ultimately changed my scientific trajectory. Uh, the book uh, is called Homicide, written by a husband and wife team, two of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson. Mm. And in the book, what they do is they argue that many patterns of criminality transcend cultures, transcend time periods, precisely because they are rooted in certain biological and evolutionary yeah. mechanisms that are universals. And the explanatory power of their explanations, of their arguments, was so mind-blowing to me. It was such an epiphany that as someone who wanted to study consumer behavior, I right away said, aha, I will do exactly what these guys are doing in studying criminality. I will apply the evolutionary framework to study consumer behavior. And so I set out and founded the field of evolutionary consumption, which is basically the idea of applying evolutionary biology and evolutionary psychology to study consumer behavior. And is that where, you know, and is that where you also look at the notion that consumption is many, many things, not just the physical act of buying goods, could be religion, it, all sorts of things. Exactly. It, it, and, and the reason why I do that is because I don't want people to be anchored on sort of the, the most obvious forms of, 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 well, consumption. So it's not just that we consume uh, Starbucks and Coca-Cola yeah. and the jeans that we wear. Those are all important consumatory choices. But everything that we do is in one sense or another consumatory. So as you said, we consume religious narratives, we consume literature, we yeah. consume uh, friendships. Uh, our our mate choices are, are the ultimate form of consumer choice. And so ultimately, I can pretty much fit most of our purpose of behavior under the umbrella of consumption. Yeah. And therefore, it's a wonderful place from which to study our shared biological heritage and our human nature. And is this also where, and as you were talking there, I was thinking that, so for example, you know, when, when we go and buy a consumer product, part of us is wired to understand that advertisers are there to sell us. So we have an internal firewall that almost says, look out for advertising behaviours. But in so much more of society, whether it's in um, the body politic or in terms of ideologies, etc., we don't necessarily have that firewall in place. Is that where your theories perhaps of the parasitic mind fit in right it, you know it's interesting that you, you you talk about the firewall because i actually argue i'm, I'm so i'm going to return to the parasitic idea but let me draw an important analogy okay. to what you just said yeah uh so if we're trying to sell chewing gum or cereals to kids the moral legal and ethical argument is well you shouldn't be allowed to do that because the children, to use your term, don't have a built-in firewall to protect against persuasive intent. Yeah. And therefore, you should only be targeting them once they have the psychological and emotional makeup to be able to counter-argue your persuasive attempts. And yet, the singular <laughs> product that is most powerful in our lives called religion yes. is one that I can advertise to my children straight out of the womb. So I can't advertise chewing gum to my children because that would be unethical, but I could feed them all sorts of narratives that will have a profound effect on their personal trajectories, if not societal mm -hmm. trajectories, and I can do that straight out of the mother's womb. It's mm -hmm. quite extraordinary of a hypocritic yeah. position. But, but also, I guess, in many ways, the Internet has allowed a whole new breed of information coming the other way without a firewall. So, for example, whether it's anti-vaccine movements or climate deniers, a lot of these movements can start to give us information that feels real and creates that kind of faux intellectualism. And, and I guess it would be great to get your reflections on, on why, you know, why are we susceptible to that and what's been the consequence of this? Right. So, and, and in a sense, in answering this question, I'll be linking it back to your previous yeah. one where you mentioned the parasitic stuff. So I argue in my forthcoming book, uh, which is the working title, the tentative title is The Parasitic Mind. Yeah. Uh, so let me sort of pull back a bit. So I argue that in the same way that there are many organisms in nature uh, 
that could be parasitized by yeah. actual brain worms. This is called neuroparasitology. So you could have a worm that rather than being an intestinal worm, there, there are neuro worms that go to your brain. Yeah. And when they attack your brain, uh, they cause you to engage in all sorts of maladaptive behavior. So, for example, Toxoplasma gondii is such a parasite that when it infects the brain of a mouse, the mouse loses its innate fear of cats. As a matter of yeah. fact, it becomes sexually attracted to cats. <laughs> There's another type of uh, brain parasite that attacks the uh, brains of ungulates, deer, yeah. moose, elk. And when they are uh, parasitized, they start engaging in what's called circling behavior. So they start going around in the same spot in yeah. a circle, and they can't extricate themselves from that you know, pattern of behavior, despite the fact that the looming predators might be coming their way. And so I take this model and I argue that human beings regrettably can be parasitized, yes, by, by actual brain worms, but they can also be parasitized by idea pathogens yeah. that also cause them to behave in profoundly maladaptive ways. And so then using the model of an epidemiologist, an epidemiologist basically decides, okay, well, where, where was patient zero? Where did this uh, infestation <laughs> yeah. start from? Well, I argue that the ecosystem where idea pathogens originate from is from the university. Yes. You know, it takes intellectuals to come up with some of the most moronic ideas possible. Uh, so yeah. postmodernism, uh, there is no absolute truth. Everything is relative. Of course, other than the one absolute truth that there are no absolute truths, uh, is this type is, is a form of intellectual terrorism. It's nihilism. It, it takes the edifices of reason, logic, and science, and it says, no, 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 everything is relative. You know, there's an indigenous way of knowing. There is a Vikas Shah way of knowing. Yeah. There is a Gad Saad way of knowing. And who are we to judge whose way of knowing is correct? So it's really a frontal attack on our most foundational edifices of reason. Yeah. So postmodernism is one such major parasite. Uh, radical feminism is another such parasite. It says that basically in the pursuit of equality between men and women, which we should all strive for, yeah. uh, we should make it that men and women become indistinguishable as creatures, which is yeah. absolute nonsense. The average lobotomized two-year-old knows that uh, males and females come in distinct categories, not better, not worse, yeah. but we are a sexually dimorphic species. So many of the full intellectual movements that you mentioned and a lot of our capacity to be parasitized, it's precisely because there's been 40, 50 years of a frontal attack in our universities of a rejection of reason and science. Yeah. So that's where it all comes from. And is that, and, and is that also where, you know, in some ways we're persuaded into thinking that political correctness and victimhood narratives are almost there seem to be an antidote to this when in fact they are also symptomatic of being parasitic thought themselves so just one classic example you know if i'm doing an interview and somebody refers to me as an an, an asian or a brown entrepreneur or something like this you know i don't care i don't care if somebody points out my skin color oh look i'm brown big deal but people skirt around it like i can't refer to you as brown anymore it's like but i am so what what do you think are the consequences of this because it seems like we're losing a huge amount of intellectual diversity and frankly the ability to have hard conversations well look when when the when the main currency becomes the management of hurt feelings <laughs> As the, yeah. the, the optimization, right? There, there's, a, there's a field, and I, I talk about this in my forthcoming book. So there's a yeah. field called operations research. Yeah. Operations research is the idea that you can use mathematical algorithms to optimize something, to maximize something or minimize something. So, for example, there's a classic problem called the traveling salesman problem in operations research. If you have a traveling salesman that has to go to 10 different cities, yeah going to each city once and never returning. How should he or she go to each of these cities, returning to the original point while, say, minimizing travel costs? Well, that actually turns out to be quite a difficult problem to solve manually. You really need to use certain algorithms to solve it. But the reason why I'm saying all this is because you, you, you have an objective function that you're trying to minimize or maximize. So now if we talk about the universities, what should the objective of the university be? Well, if it's 
the pursuit of knowledge unencumbered by any obstacles, mm. well, we then have a particular ethos that we adhere to. If the new objective function, if the new thing that we have to maximize or minimize is hurt feelings, <laughs> then we end up with a completely different trajectory. Yeah. So if you and I are sitting in a classroom and we want to talk about the epidemiology of violent crime, and if it turns out, as it does, that young men are overwhelmingly more likely to commit violent crimes than, el than, than elderly women, that's a fact. Yes. That's an epidemiological mm -hmm. fact. Now, I could raise my hand and say, wait a minute, Professor, I'm a young guy and I feel marginalized and disenfranchised by your hate facts. So that's the problem. Well, once you have a tension between hurt feelings and truth, that's when the edifice of truth collapses. Okay. And then how, but then how did we end up in this situation to the extent that culture and truth seem to have become disconnected to the extent that, and I totally get that, I, when I've been doing guest lectures at different universities, I've had that same situation where when we talked about, for example, CSR, or we talk about crime prevention, and we talk about young black men, and I've had a young black guy stand up in class and go, but, you know, I'm young and black and I'm not a criminal. I said, well, that's fine, but 90% of them are. And you have to realize that's the truth to be able to move forward. So how did we get this breakdown between culture and truth? Yeah, so I think it's because it comes. So I, I've coined a malady. I refer to it as collective Munchausen and collective Munchausen by proxy. Yeah. Uh, and and the, 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 yeah. the place that I've come to this uh, diagnosis is that, it, uh, so to kind of give you the background, back in 2010, I had written a scientific uh, article in a medical journal where I sought to explain, evolutionarily speaking, yeah. something that is quite difficult to explain from an evolutionary perspective, namely Munchausen proxy, uh, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Let me explain the two forms yeah, and then I'll link it back to your question. So Munchausen syndrome is when a person feigns illness or or medical condition so that they can garner empathy and sympathy. That's yeah. Munchausen syndrome. Munchausen syndrome by proxy is when you take someone who is under your care, typically your <clears throat> biological child, yeah. but it could be your pet, it could be your elderly parent, and then you harm that person or entity that's under your care so that you can then garner the empathy and sympathy yeah. by proxy. And so in explaining that phenomenon, and then several years down the line, seeing everybody engaging in a hysteria of, I'm a victim, oh, Trump just won, and I'm a brown woman, Will it yeah. still be safe for me to go to my university? I mean, so let's let's unpack that. So you think that there's going to be roadblocks that the death <laughs> that the death militia of Trump set up, where they take brown women and send them off, they veer them off to uh, mass gang rape centers, right? But it was very intoxicating for people. It was orgiastic yeah. to then build a narrative of victimhood, right? I'm a victim. No, I'm a bigger victim. So I call that victimology poker. Right. Yeah. Uh, who holds the biggest hand in victimology? And one of the reasons why it's very difficult for all of these cretins, these social justice warriors to come after me is because I always say, be careful. If you come after me, I always hold a higher victimology poker hand than you. Yeah. I'm a war refugee. I am from the Middle East. So I'm Arabic. I happen to be Jewish. You, you really are going to lose. And, <laughs> and, and incredibly, yeah. that makes these idiots run away, right? Yeah. Had I been called John Smith from Arkansas, then I could never say probably any of the stuff that I could say, or not at least with as, as little blowback. Yeah. But, and I'm sure you could probably do the same. Oh, I'm a brown person, so you can't mess with me. Now, how idiotic is it that I can actually use this to, to, to strengthen my argument yeah. rather than simply you judging the veracity of my arguments. So to answer your question broadly, we went from an ethos of truth, reason, logic, evidence-based thinking to an ethos of uh, victimology. And until we're able to redress that, we're going to keep sinking into the abyss of infinite lunacy. And is this where actually social networks have made it worse in a way because now for example in that sense if i if i thought of myself as i am a victim because i am asian i can go on hundreds of facebook groups and whatsapp groups and things like that to almost have my view reinforced by other so-called victims 
but there's not very many ways for me to have that view challenged. I mean, do you think that social networks have almost been a catalyst for some of these evolutionary behaviours without us realising? I mean, to the extent that it can ex increase the velocity at which bullshit can spread, <laughs> right? Yeah. Before, you know, it was, you know, I had to send you a letter 400 years ago. It took uh, six months before you and I could communicate. Now we could take the conversation we're having. I could post yeah. it on my channel and within two hours, you know, 100,000 people have viewed it. So I think, you know, there are wonderful elements to social media. And, and certainly I'm well aware of that as someone who, who deals in the currency of ideas, I'm like a kid in a candy store. The fact that I can use all these tools to yeah. spread ideas. You know, uh, Vikas Shah and Gatsad would never have met probably were it not for the far reaches yes. of social media. Exactly, yeah. So on the one hand, it's very liberating. On the other hand, as you said, it allows us to spread bullshit at a you know speed yeah. of light. It allows us to build very uh, dogged uh, echo chambers, as you correctly point pointed right i mean i've had people who i otherwise you know respected and who had become my thought friends who've unfollowed me on twitter uh because they could no longer let's say handle the fact that i don't spend all day criticizing trump yeah or you know and 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 that's just so unfortunate i mean you were earlier talking about intellectual diversity there's a a wonderful analogy that i like to uh point out here about intellectual diversity if i may uh, it's not mine actually i wish it were mine it, it comes from a neuropsychiatrist out of australia he had written an article comparing the sterility of diversity of thought the fact that there you know that there there isn't diversity of thought on campuses to something from evolutionary medicine uh, called the uh, uh, anti hygiene uh, hypothesis yeah. so if you if you look at for example children who suffer from uh, inflammatory diseases let's say uh, asthma if they grew up in environments where they faced pollutants where let's say there was pet dander yes. where there was a yeah, bit yeah. more dust you didn't grow up in a quasi hospital room you actually are less likely to suffer from asthma because in a sense your immune system has to be exposed to these pollutants for it to be triggered to do its its work and if you grow up in a very sterile environment you're more likely to be asthmatic and so on so he took this idea from evolutionary medicine and brilliantly applied it to the sterility or lack thereof yeah. of intellectual diversity so how could you expect young minds to develop critical thinking if they are only exposed to ideas that support their a priori positions. And, and the way that you know this is if you look at the professoriate there, for example, in the US, the Democrat to the uh, Republican ratio of professors, it's simply appalling. Yes. So you yeah. have departments where it's 44 to one ratio, 80 to one ratio. Now, some idiots will write to me and say, but professor, come on, uh, prof professors are smart, therefore, of course, they're going to be liberal, therefore, of course, they're going to be Democrats. Well, when it comes to the theory of evolution, if, if you are a conservative Republican uh, who denies evolution, then, of course, you're going against scientific facts. But when it comes to debating fiscal policy or foreign policy or whether the death penalty is just or not, or what immigration policy should be, there is no absolute yes. scientific fact. There are valid and plausible arguments on both sides of the aisle, and I, as a young student, should have the right, uh, if not the expectation, to yeah. be exposed to both both sides. And I, and I think, as you were talking there, it made me realise, really, that I, don't, I think the younger generation now have forgotten the consequences of not listening to both sides. Because we've seen it before when society fractures because of economics or, or whichever, whatever reason, ideologies filter in, people stop listening to the other side, and then all of a sudden society is capable of atrocities. All over the world we've seen that. But what practically do you think there's anything we can do? Because this seems like such a runaway problem now in terms of the fact that the, the, the anti-truth movement seems to be winning. Right. It seems to be that the discourse around you know, political correctness, these movements seem to be winning and it seems to be yeah. much harder to have rational, truth-based, fact-based discourse. You know, what can we do to create a more resilient society yes. now? Well, certainly by uh, 
I don't know if you know the the concept from uh, actually a good friend of mine, Nassim Talib. Uh, the he had, his latest book was on anti fragility, yes, right? Excellent book. Uh, yeah. Right. I, I, sorry, that wasn't his latest. The, the latest one is Skin in the Game. Uh, the one before that, right? Yeah. So the idea is uh, we. We, we benefit psychologically and emotionally from being anti-fragile creatures, right? Yeah. I mean, I should have my positions once in a while challenged and rocked. And that allows me to build anti-fragility into my personhood. If you, if you presume that I'm such a fragile creature that I could never be challenged on my positions, then you really are not doing me any service. So that's yeah. point one. Now, what can we do? Really, there is no... It's going to sound banal what I'm going to say, but ultimately it's the only solution. And that is for everybody to make a commitment to participate in however small way or however yeah. large way in the battle of ideas. What I receive, as you might imagine, I mean, innumerable messages from people from around the world on a daily basis. Hey, professor, you know, you've inspired me. I'd like to contribute. What can yeah. I do? You know, well, when you hear your professor spouting something that you disagree with, challenge him or her politely. Don't be afraid. When someone on Facebook posts something that you disagree with, challenge them. When you're sitting at a bar having a conversation, don't shy away from a conversation because that might have an effect on your friendship. If your friendship can't withstand a disagreement on some important issue, then screw that friend. Yeah. They're not worthy of your friendship. So really there is no other magical recipe yeah. other than not diffusing the responsibility on a few people. So many people engage in what uh, you, you might have heard this term, tragedy in the commons is an economic term. Let me just give you the background to it. I'm basically giving you my whole book here in, in about uh, 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> Tragedy of the Commons is, a, is an economic uh, dilemma that was first uh, uh, pointed to in the late 60s. Uh, let me describe it with an actual example. Yeah. So let's say you have a bunch of farmers that each of whom uh, is using a particular plot of land for their livestock to graze on that land. And then they realize that the land is really suffering. It needs a couple of years to recover. So they come to a gentleman's agreement that no one will be using that plot of land for their livestock to graze on it. They agree on that. And then one farmer says, you know what would be the best solution actually, is if I were to cheat on my agreement, if I were to let my livestock graze on that land while the other ones remain honorable well the land will still recover and at least <laughs> i get to, right yeah. now the tragedy of the commons is that every single one of them thinks along those ways and then they all end up raping the land that is trying to recover now how do we apply this to the question you asked me well the tragedy of the commons in this case is everybody says let god sad he's got big shoulders let him fight on my behalf and i'll go on worrying about my wife's uh you know, whatever, yeah. and buying my tomatoes at the grocery store. Let others do the heavy work. I'll just kind of clap from the sidelines and say, good job, professor. No, don't diffuse the responsibility. You don't have to have a huge YouTube channel or be a fancy professor to have a voice. Use it. Yeah. And once enough people do that, then the small intellectual terrorists that do hold the discourse hostage. People think, people oftentimes write to me and say, well, Professor, aren't you overestimating, aren't you exaggerating the number of social justice warriors there are on campuses? Yeah. I say, no, I'm not. It doesn't, there were, it only, you only needed 19 really committed people on 9-11 to do a lot of damage. You didn't need 19 million, yeah. you needed 19 people. So you don't need a million social justice warriors to keep the rest of us hostage yeah. on campus. Fight against the idiots. And there's also, there's also this phenomenon too where people substitute acts that seem like action when they're not instead of action. So people <clears> might <throat> click the Oxfam page and think they've done something or they might attend a protest in a liberal democracy and think it's, it's an issue. So my, my wife, for example, wants to go to the um, People's Vote protest in London. And I've said to her, protests only matter if protesting is illegal. If you go to a country <laughs> where protesting is legal and you can stand outside parliament and go, parliament are all a bunch of idiots without getting killed, your protest is meaningless. But the emotional response to that is the same as the rush of them doing something. You know, is, is, is this an issue, you know, in terms of people substituting the emotional response of activism for actual activism? Uh, I, I mean, excuse me, my, <clears throat> excuse my voice. 
I'm, I'm literally giving you some of the highlights of my book because I have a whole section in my book where I talk about, so now I'm going to take exactly the words that you said and I'm yeah. going to put them in an evolutionary biological yeah. context. <coughs> and so let me give you the background. Uh, in biology, we have something called costly signaling. Yeah. Co costly signaling, and the classic example is the peacock's tail, but there's a million other cases, <laughs> but let's go yeah. with that one. The peacock's tail has evolved despite the fact that it reduces the survivability of the peacock, right? Yeah. It increases his visibility to potential predators. It makes it more difficult for him to take flight. So from a natural selection perspective, the peacock should not have evolved that tail. But he has evolved that tail because it actually confers upon him mating advantage. Yeah. And specifically, that peacock's tail, because it is burdensome, because it reduces his survivability, because it is so wasteful, it is actually an honest signal of his phenotypic quality. It is basically an, a neon sign saying, look, despite the fact that I'm carrying this very wasteful appendage here, I'm still standing here. So you should really pick me because I'm big dog. I'm the top dog, yeah. right? It's actually a profound point, right? Now let's link it to what you just said. Virtue signaling is not a costly signal. A costly signal is going to, to use your example, to a protest in the Middle East where you're going to end up disappearing in some hellhole to never be seen again. That's impressive. Going to London with a bunch of other idiots so that you can get a little dopamine hit that you are a virtuous person is worth nothing, right? Now, people sometimes write to me and say, well, but professor, you're protected by tenure. Well, the death threats that I receive are not, tenure doesn't protect me from those. Yeah. When I have to file report with the Montreal police, or when I have to go to campus and check in with security, or when I don't get a million other professorships because people are afraid to associate with me yeah. because I am the, so it, no, tenure is not something that protects me from the endless amount of negative consequences that I've had to bear. So if you truly want to fight, then to go back to Nassim Talib and his book, Skin in the Game, Skin in the Game is just a colloquialism for costly signal. Yeah. For you to have skin in the game, you have to bear a cost. If you don't, you're a bullshitter. Yeah. And where do you find the courage yourself to do that? Because again, I, I was <clears throat> on the eternal, you know, black hole of Twitter, I'd seen somebody post something about journalists are only prepared to stand up for what they believe in so long as it doesn't affect them getting promoted. And it made me really think that actually it's true because many of these bigger battles we need to fight require us to really have the skin in the game. But, you know, for example, in an academic career, you know, where these things are very costly, where do you as an individual find the courage to fight and what, you know, how can we do that as well? Th th thank you for that uh, question. Uh, the best way I could answer it is my personhood does not allow me to be exposed to bullshit <laughs> and attacks on truth yeah. and my not responding. I am personally offended in a true sense of the word offense, not culture of victimhood. I am psychically injured. Yeah. when I see the endless attacks on truth. And that carries more weight in my personal conduct than careerist aspirations. Now you might say, oh, but isn't that, aren't you just being a martyr? No, because when I go to bed at night and I lay my head down, I need to, before I fall asleep, feel that, <clears throat> excuse me, no there is nothing that I could have done that I choose, chose not to do because I was cowardly. And then that allows me to go to sleep because I could, I, I, I've cleared my very high threshold of what I consider to be yeah. proper personal conduct. Once I say, but you know, if I speak out, then this careerist aspiration might be, then I'm a cheat. And the worst thing for me is to not have a very high moral conduct. So now you might say, but not everybody has that same exacting moral conduct, professor. Well, whatever it is that you're doing, that's what you should aspire to. In other words, set your bar to be 
defending the truth rather than your selfish. I mean, look, all people in the world that have made change looked beyond themselves, right? Yeah. Whether, I mean, but Martin Luther King, and I'm not suggesting that I'm Martin Luther King, but anyone who's done anything, great scientists yeah. who became great, it's be precisely because they fought against the orthodoxy, right? So great people rise to the occasion. You don't have to be great in that you become a famous professor, but you could be great in your personal yeah. conduct so that when you lay your head down on your pillow, you say, I did all that I can. Yeah. And until we can foster that exacting personal conduct in everyone, they will keep deflecting the responsibility on the few of us, and then we will lose the battle of ideas. Wow. And um, <clears throat> w one sort of final question, if I may, on this is... Of course. You know, we, we talk, we've talked uh, you know, in this about truth um, a, f a few times. And for, for many of us in civil society, it's kind of difficult sometimes to determine what is and isn't a truth now. And right. what would be your advice? What would be your advice in terms of how do you approach it when you're, confront, when you're confronted personally with so many inputs and noise and conversations and all this? How do you determine what is and isn't a truth that you are able to put some, some hang your hat on, so to speak? Another fantastic question. Uh, and another chapter in my forthcoming book. Yeah. Uh, so there are different ways to measure truth. So there is, for example, an axiomatic truth. For example, there's something in, in, in behavioral decision theory called the transitivity axiom. Yeah. If I prefer car A to car B and I prefer car B to car C, I must prefer car A to car C. Otherwise, I am being irrational in that sense. So one way to, if you'd like, uh, define truth yeah. is by axioms. Uh, so, for example, mathematical logic has axioms of truth. They are truth tables. The world, though, is not made up of these, <laughs> these, these black and white sort of axiomatic truths. So then the way that you address your question is you build if what I call a mental hygiene of good decision making. Uh, so one of the things that I talk about is this idea of, and, and forgive me, it's going to be a, a big scientific no, explanation. No, go for it. Uh, Thank you. Uh, th there's something I like to use called nomological networks of cumulative evidence. A nomological network of cumulative evidence is the means by which you demonstrate that some phenomenon is an adaptation mm -hmm. in evolutionary psychology. So, for example, if I want to prove to you that toy preferences are indeed innate, that there are biological basis to toy preferences. So contrary to the social constructivist argument that it is socialization that causes little Johnny to prefer trucks and little Linda to prefer uh, dolls, there is actually a biological basis. How would I go about demonstrating that to you? So I need to build for you a nomological network, this big network of cumulative evidence, which when you are confronted with this amount of evidence, this tsunami of evidence, it drowns you. OK, so how do I do that? So I might, for example, get data from many different cultures that vary greatly, showing that little boys and little girls have that exact preference. I might get data across time periods. So, for example, there is data from ancient uh, Greece and ancient Rome where on funerary monuments, mausoleums, where they had, the, you know, the stones yeah. were etched with a thing. You see little boys playing with sex-specific toys. And now this yeah. is from 2,500 yeah. years yeah. ago. You have other data coming from pediatric endocrinology, where, for example, little girls who suffer from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a endocrinological disorder that masculinizes little girls. So girls who suffer from this endocrinological disorder exhibit toy preferences <laughs> that are akin yeah. to those of boys. So bit by bit, wow. I can build you this network that makes your position completely impossible to hold. In other words, I don't get into hysteria. I don't call you names. I put on my scientist thinking hat. I say, what would be the evidence that I need to show Vikas to hopefully sway him? So this is the only way to get to truth, yeah. right? And again, to go back to our earlier conversation, but once you're able to interrupt me and say, I don't want to hear your truth because it offends me, yeah. then that process has been violated. So get rid of hurt feelings. Nobody gives a shit about your hurt feelings. And develop a framework for understanding how to navigate through data 
like a scientist. Not everybody is a professional scientist, but everybody can use the methods of yeah. the scientific method in navigating through the world, and we will all be better armed and informed citizens.